Hello everyone and welcome to another Big Data London webinar. Today we're looking at enterprise data marketplaces. Um, so I'm Andy Steed, uh, Content Director of Big Data London and I'm joined today again by Mike Ferguson. Hi Mike. Hi Andy. And uh, Paul Moxon. Hi Paul. Hi Andy. So uh, these sessions are designed to be interactive so please send your questions using the question bar underneath the video panel there. Um, and we'll endeavor to ask the panelists as many as we can in the time we have after the presentations. Um, quick note of housekeeping, if you lose the stream at any point, you shouldn't, but if you do, just hit refresh in your browser and you'll jump straight back in. Um, however, without further ado, I'd like to uh, throw it over to our first presenter, uh, over to you, Mike. Okay, thanks a lot, Andy. Just get my, uh, share my desktop here. Okay, so uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who, wherever you may be. Uh, thanks for taking time to come to the webinar today. So I wanted to talk about enterprise data marketplaces and what's driven the need for these um, uh, within the enterprise, uh, not just uh, as an external uh, thing, externally facing thing, but within the enterprise. So what I want to look at is, is quickly uh, summarize the problem, the problem of untrusted data and how many companies have been rethinking their data strategy as a new way to start rapidly delivering um, data assets that can be consumed and used across multiple different analytical data stores um, in different analytical workloads. Uh, and, uh, and in the context of doing that, introduce an enterprise data marketplace and, and what this is, look at the kind of requirement for that and the types of assets that you would get published in an enterprise data marketplace um, and, and how it should function. You know, what should be the roles and responsibilities around this? You know, what, what are the things you have to consider if you're going to establish a, an enterprise data marketplace and the, and the kind of challenges around that? And then how do you kind of you know, maximize reuse of the assets that are you know, published in that marketplace so that, that people can get, you know, maximum value from it and shorten the time to value by taking advantage of stuff that's already built rather than always having to create everything from scratch. Um, okay, so uh, let's just, first of all, just start with, with the kind of business drivers behind this. We've seen from lots of surveys, this one I took uh, as a 2020 survey, a relatively recent one, you know, showing that um, you know, the real demand uh, at the sea level, this is a sea level executive um, survey, but the, 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 de the demand amongst sea level execs is really high now for artificial intelligence and machine learning. You see different kind of categories here of, of CEOs from the kind of torchbearer, the kind of trailblazer CEOs on the top right there to the kind of bottom left is the kind of aspirational ones who kind of kind of lag a little, a little bit of a laggard to some extent rather than the ones that are leading the leading the charge. But it, but if you look at, at, at the torchbearers, you know, you can clearly see that they, they see the benefit coming from uh, automating and accelerating their ability to respond to business uh, demands and market changes uh, driven by artificial intelligence um, and, and, and machine learning. Uh, and so the expectation and, in fact, the willingness to invest is there already from the C-level execs. Um, but if you're going to really disrupt uh, with... Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you can't really do that unless you, you're building on a foundation of trusted data. And what we've seen um, with the whole data landscape has been a, a massive explosion in new sources of data from the traditional stuff to, to machine-generated data, such as IoT data, clickstream data, uh, various kinds of infrastructure log files, human-generated data like social network opinions on Twitter to inbound emails or even voice data coming into your contact center that's recorded and available for analysis, uh, as well as external data sources, whether they're free like open government data uh, sites where you can download lots of uh, free data sets or, or paid 
uh, uh, subscription-based uh, data sets that you can buy in, depending on your industry, from various suppliers. All of it is now in play as far as uh, analytics is concerned. And the challenge with that is you know, we've got we've got all that data coming in. It spawned a whole bunch of new analytical workloads, everything from deep learning, um, maybe on GPUs in the cloud. Um, using Spark or something like that, or um, or, or, or maybe we're, we're doing traditional data warehouse, we could be doing streaming analytics, we could be using a graph database uh, to you know build uh, a graph of nodes and edges to do some kind of um, fraud analysis or something like that, or even social network influencer analysis to assist marketing and targeting influencers and things like that. There's, there's a whole gamut, if you like, of of analytical work that have, that have kicked off on the back of all this new data. And of course, the whole thing's now available to be done on the cloud, or for most of us, we're living in a hybrid world where some of it's in the cloud, some of it's in the data center. And I think you know that, that will continue for some time, probably multiple clouds, certainly not just one. Um, but the bottom line is, so far, we've just been building silos. You know, so that the data flow is taking from sources into data warehouse or into MDM or into cloud storage in Spark or Hadoop in Spark or, or into a graph database, et cetera. They're all different. They're all different silos. They've all got, in many cases, different tooling behind it. And, um, uh, and there's a significant amount of reinvention going on. And if you look at the challenge here, it's how many tools have you got across all of these silos? You know, um, could be a pretty large number if you, uh, add in things like R and Python and Scala into the mix, as well as the maybe drag and drop and self-service data prep technologies that you may already have out there. And of course, metadata sharing across all these silos and tools is not really possible because there's no standard. You have to hope that the vendors you've selected will talk to each other through APIs to get some kind of metadata interchange. Otherwise, you have to rekey data uh, from scratch all over again for everything you're doing in a different silo. But the other challenge going on is that all the data that's now available to us is coming in everywhere. It's, it's coming into cloud storage, coming into uh, big data Hadoop systems, and whether those are on the cloud or on-premises, it's coming into you know, SQL databases, again, could be on the cloud or on-premises. Uh, we could even be capturing data and storing at the edge in edge databases these days. So there's a raft of different data stores. And so it's not surprisingly, people are kind of getting overwhelmed by the complexity of their data landscape. Uh, just finding data, never mind governing it, is hard enough. And um, you know, it's it, it's just becoming more and more difficult. And yet the expectation, if you remember back to that first slide on a CEO expectation is that they're going to trailblaze. They really want agility, want to be able to move on the back of disruptive um, machine learning and AI in order to help them, uh, you know, really make a difference in, in the market. And the explosion of data coming in, lots of data sources has put so much pressure on IT that I think a lot of business just view them as a bottleneck and just say, well, you know, we want to. We want in. We want to be able to do this for ourselves. And so we've seen an explosion of self-service data prep tools over the <clears throat> last um, uh, four or five years. Uh, everything from BI vendors uh, releasing this kind of capability to you know standalone uh, self-service data prep vendors as well. All of it is out there. But the danger, I guess, from a governance perspective, is you end up with hundreds of silos of everybody doing their own thing with their own tool and nobody sharing anything. Um, and of course, as, if there's no standard to share metadata across tools, then that makes it even harder to, to deal with. So the concern here is you get garbage in, garbage out because everybody's producing their own data, could be doing it the same data again and again and again, but slightly differently. And so you inadvertently end up with inconsistency everywhere, lots of versions and not much in the way of governance. And I kind of think what's really required is we need some kind of uh, fabric, if you like, that goes all the way across multiple clouds and data center and edge and all the data stores is able to connect to that, maybe have a catalog to discover what's in all those data stores and a data fabric to allow you to build pipelines um, by connecting to any of it, irrespective of where the data may be. Um, 
<clears throat> and the idea behind that is hopefully that you can produce trusted data uh, for reuse around the enterprise rather than um, expecting everybody to start from scratch and build everything again and again. And so I kind of think that there's a trend going on in a lot of my clients now, which is very much about saying, well, you know, should we just go best of breed or would it be much better to bring multi different teams together, perhaps uh, supported by a center of excellence, but have those teams kind of work on a common platform, common data fabric and catalog, you know, extensible analytical platform where you can add multiple libraries, you know, to go build models in order to be more and more effective and speed up uh, productivity because we could share metadata uh, if, we're, if we're all using common tooling uh, or at least a lot less tooling that we've been using in the past. <clears throat> and I guess the whole idea behind this is to be able to produce a kind of um, uh, data lake and uh, ingest any kind of data, structured, unstructured, internal or external, from a range of different data stores, whether they be on-premises or in the cloud or all the way out to the edge, uh, and then produce you know, these kind of trusted data assets that can be published in a marketplace, which brings me to the whole concept of data marketplaces. So, you know, the whole idea here is ready-made. You know, you you produce ready-made trusted data assets that then become easy to find and consume and use, rather than expect everybody to go build everything from scratch again and again. So the objective being that you can build once and reuse every reuse everywhere. Uh, rather than um, having to reinvent all over the place. And so the, the, the data marketplace is really a catalog. Um, it's a catalog, however, that contains ready-made trusted data uh, and analytical assets, which are available as, as services. They've got documented common data names in a glossary, full lineage to know where the data came from, how it was transformed, Etc. Uh, and, and it's all tagged and organized to make it easy to find, easy to share, and quick to be able to access and provision to whoever needs it. <clears throat> so, if you like the, even though we call these things a data marketplace, uh, I think the trend is to go way beyond data, not just physical data uh, sets available that you could pick up and reuse, but virtual ones as well, which can be done on data virtualization. Uh, products like Denodo, where you could have um, virtual views that are all published as reusable trusted assets, which already integrate data that you need, and so you don't have to go and do it yourself. It's already there, available for you to use. We may have queries that we want to save as a service and just launch to provision data for us. Ultimately, I think uh, analytics catalogs and data catalogs will merge, so we end up with BI reports in the catalog, dashboards, predictive models, even decision services, which may give you a recommendation, for example, or, or even mobile apps, um, ultimately, you know, pre, pre built, um, ready to go that you can just find available. Now we're talking within the enterprise here, a kind of shop window, if you like, within the enterprise. And the idea is that you can publish these assets into, into this data marketplace, this, this catalog so that people can then, you know, consumers out there rather than, have to go and build from scratch can find a, an increasing amount of ready-made um, <clears throat> assets that they can reuse and jumpstart their project, which would allow them to live up to expectations at the sea level by then delivering value relatively quickly, taking advantage of, um, of this reusable data assets. And so if we're thinking about that, doing that, however, within the enterprise, um, there are a lot, of thing, a lot of things to think about. For example, um, what are the roles and responsibilities about you know, making a data marketplace work within your enterprise? And, and, and you know, what, what do you need there? And, 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 and what about asset publishing? I mean, can anybody publish data into this thing or, or is there some kind of governance process around that? Um, what about, you know, what about yeah, go governing that whole thing? What about governing who's allowed to see what from a consumer perspective? Uh, so that, you know, and, and if you're not allowed access to a certain data asset from a consumer perspective, is there some governance process that m might give you access to, to that data, you know, if you were granted permission? 
how do the consumers navigate this marketplace? You know, is there some facility to do that, like a search or something like that, or a faceted search, so that they can quickly uh, find the data assets that they're looking for? Can they collaborate? Maybe like you do, you know, if you're about to buy a product, you can collaborate with somebody and say, hey, you know, you bought this product, what do you think? Well, you're using this data, what do you think? Well, could, could, couldn't, we, um, could, couldn't we do that within the enterprise? Could we not get reviews about, about the data that's available in the marketplace within the enterprise so that we could then follow up with folks and after reading their reviews? You know, all of that would be kind of cool in a collaborative environment. And what happens if a consumer takes some of this data and builds on it and produces something even more valuable, like a new virtual view uh, that integrates other data assets? Um, <clears throat> in which case, well, what about that? Could we not publish that back into the marketplace so that people could then um, take advantage of that new asset that's been built? And so we kind of incrementally build on top of, of more and more of these trusted assets. And so create an increasing amount of reusable um, uh, capabilities that we that, that, that we have available to our projects. And so hopefully get an even faster start on subsequent follow-on projects. Well, how are we going to provision it? You know, do you provision this data physically in a data in a database somewhere? Do you make it available as a JSON file through an API or maybe a, a XML even, or, or 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 do you publish it as a virtual view? How, how, how's that going to work? What about monitoring? How do you know what assets are being used? You know, what's the frequency of the use? <clears throat> of these particular assets so that you can kind of work out value associated with them. You know, is a particular data asset used in a predict, you know, as input to a predictive model um, a million times a day, maybe if the predictive model runs a million times a day, that would be potentially very valuable data. You know, we, we want to be able to monitor the use of all of these things to understand, you know, what data assets are valuable across the enterprise and which ones are not and which ones are just never being used, which ones are being constantly reused. And maybe you might want to expose it to the outside world, maybe to your partners, to your suppliers, uh, maybe even to your customers and start to think about monetizing that data that's out there. So there's a lot to think about around the data marketplace. Also the, um, uh, the roles and responsibilities around that. You know, well, well, well what are they? Um, well, for example, Asset producers, who, who's a, who's allowed to do that? You know, is there a, a manager in, in charge of that? Is there some QA uh, process around that in, in order to make sure that's the case? Uh, wh what about the asset owners? I mean, if I publish a data asset, a data set like customer data, for example, into a marketplace, who's the owner of that data? Who's the owner of a, uh, if I publish a, a new, predictive model that predicts uh, customer churn, who's the owner of that model? You know, so who's producing the stuff? Who owns it? And who's responsible for publishing it? And is anyone uh, then responsible for monitoring it and making sure that, you know, governance around the, those assets is upheld, whether those that's related to access to, to that data or whether it's related to retention of the data or the policies associated with that, for example. And who are the consumers, you know, and uh, that, that, are, that have got access to this? And if you get a lot of assets over time, a lot of data assets over time, is there some way to organize that, like maybe a taxonomy that could make it easy to find this? So you could kind of zoom in on a hierarchy kind of style to the, 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 the data that you need or the analytical assets that you need. And if that's the case, who's designing the taxonomy? It brings back the whole, you know, that, that was a hot job way back in the early 2000s, you know, when portals were around and now all of a sudden it's hot again uh, in order to organize this stuff to make it easy to find for business. And of course, who's administering the whole catalog underpinning the, the, the marketplace? And by publishing, you know, the, there may need to be some gov governance around this. If I want to put something in a data marketplace, maybe it's not just anyone can do that. Maybe there is some QA around this, you know, to check that, the, you know, the, the, the data being published is 
got common data names in a business glossary within the catalog. It's got lineage. It's got policies defined in order to be able to govern access security or privacy if there's sensitive data uh, in that data asset. Um, <clears throat> maybe there's a new version of this. How are you controlling version management of these assets that are published there? <clears throat> when is it that you know uh, an asset expires and is and is replaced by a new version? Uh, all of that needs to be thought about. And could we maybe identify the assets associated with a business objective? For example, if I'm trying to reduce fraud, could you tell me all the assets that are in play? To help me do that, you know, so that I could uh, quickly determine what have we already got in place that's helping to reduce fraud or helping to improve customer engagement. So, you know, when we have uh, a need for uh, data, uh, typically somewhere in a business, we've got a business problem. We, we're tasking someone to try and solve that problem. Maybe that's a data. Uh, sorry, maybe it's a, a business analyst or someone like that. First question is going to come into their head is, well, what, what have we already got? And the question is, well, you know, where are you going to find that? And you're going to find that in a, in, in, a, in a marketplace. So what they want is some facility to search uh, to see what's available um, to, you know, solve their business problem. Is it trusted? You know, is this okay, high quality data? Is there any sensitive data in here? Maybe it's, um, you know, not allowed access to it for that reason or so, something like that. Is it, has it been rated by others or, around the enterprise to understand its value? You know, and is it, you know, who rated it? You know, maybe I could contact them and collaborate with them. You know, and is there any other data that if I wanted this data, is there any other data I should know about that, that would maybe give me a more complete set of data that I need for my problem because the relationships between the data I'm looking at and the data that I, uh, and other data sets is, is maybe already understood. Is that available to me? And, and can I order this, stick it in a shopping cart almost like a, like an Amazon style capability and even specify how I want it provisioned and understand who owns it and that kind of thing. So this kind of opens up requirements for, for what's needed in a data marketplace. Like, I need a search box. I need faceted search to zoom in on what I'm looking for. I need assisted navigation. It'd be kind of nice if we had AI built into this marketplace so that um, you know we could get recommendations made to us around related data so that we don't miss anything that could be valuable to us. You know, is there a way to sort of bookmark it, like put it in my favorites that I going to use this regularly, or even subscribe to it maybe on a continuous weekly basis or daily basis you know uh, if i need it if i need it on a on a regular um, sch scheduled in, uh, points in time and and can i tag it you know just uh, with my own tagging or whatever to quickly find it again so so that I, I i just know where it is these kind of things all needed to quickly find data so in a way you you kind of want a user interface which is almost like Amazon. You hear you're just looking at Amazon. You know that I, I want to buy a book here, for example. And so you can see a number of books. I have a search box at the top of the screen. I got fastest search, which I've circled on the left hand side. You know, I've got these books here, and they're all rated, right? And then I can add them to. I can see how many people rated it, and I can add it to a shopping cart. I want exactly the same thing inside the enterprise, but I don't want to see books. I want to see data. I want to see data assets that I can just add to my shopping cart and just say, that's what I want uh, so that I can, it's ready made, it's ready to go, it's documented, it's got a glossary to tell me what the data means, it's got lineage to say where it came from and, and gives me the ability to jumpstart my project and get going rather than just say, well, it's out there somewhere in all these data stores. Here's a bunch of tools. You figure it out. We, we don't want to do that. What we want to do is jumpstart these projects. And so in the ideal world, you know, rather than just go to a special user interface for a data marketplace, I'd also like it integrated, plugged in to my BI tools or my data science tools or my self-service data prep tools so that I could just browse what's available in my data marketplace, select what I need, and then go 
do preparation on it or go analyze it with a BI tool or 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 use it to just jumpstart my feature selection for training a model if I'm building it on a data science workbench. All of that is kind of there. So we want we want the ability to shop for data, have people around the business, then take what they need and then go and build value from it. You know, jumpstart their projects so that they can quickly get a get a move on and and, and and drive value and you think well how many places could you do that i mean you could do stuff in sales marketing finance all across the business just building pipelines on the back of ready made as a, as a jump start and also um as a as a base of trusted data that's already documented and available to me in, in a catalog within the enterprise all with secure access and governance and everything so that ultimately we can get to a situation where business users can, you know, kind of bookmark their data, you know, easy to shop for information, easy to, you know, go somewhere like a glossary if you're not sure what the data means that's in, in the catalog that's been maybe some new data has arrived, not sure what it means. Lineage to give the confidence. can maybe whatever x uh talk to use people have used it you know all of that that we can then collaborate and start really getting uh moving with this data and, and and producing value from it and so that we should be able to see things like this like ratings or who's using it maybe i should even be able to follow them like twitter you know to be able to just uh, you know have a sort of social network breaking out around data within the enterprise all in the data marketplace why not? I mean, that should be the kind of capabilities that we kind of need here. But if you do want to put it in your know, shopping cart, well, do you really need a physical copy of it? I mean, we don't really need everybody dragging a copy of this data, you know, uh, to, to, to wherever they are. We don't want thousands of copies out there all over the place because clearly we would have to then catalog every copy. In an ideal world, actually, you'd rather not do that. You'd rather, you know, have the virtualization get written. no need to copy the data, just provision it virtually to whoever needs it with the view that they need, uh, so that we don't end up with huge amounts of data redundancy and copies flying around all over the place, and and lose control of that again, and fall foul of ungoverned data, and we're not sure where it came from and whatnot, which could potentially happen again over time. So I guess what we're looking at here is is producing ready-made trusted data assets that are published in a catalog. The catalog forms your data marketplace and allows you to see both physical data assets that you created in virtual uh, views of that data, um, virtual data assets that you can build on top of it and publish that into the marketplace, which is all going to hopefully over time speed up people in getting access to uh, ready-made data rather than constantly just being told to go back to zero and build it all from scratch. And so potentially with the likes of data virtualization, we could um, combine those data assets together, maybe from different underlying data stores and produce a complete integrated view of something like an integrated view of customer and all the insights about customers that you could then make available to multiple applications in different channels and kind of create an omni-channel style effect of consistent data feeding all front office applications that, that would then allow you to um, treat the customer consistently in any channel. And of course, if you, if you search a marketplace and you're not, not uh, allowed access to it, you should still be able to know who the owner is so that you can then request access to the owner of that data uh, and then either have it approved or not. If it's approved, maybe a data steward then grants you access to the data, notifies you, and then you, you're up and running. That's just a governance uh, process around it just to make sure that we're, we're, we're able to trace who's using the data uh, and, and when they ask permission to use it and whatnot. But ultimately, the idea is that uh, people build on top of these ready-made trusted data assets, produce new stuff, new uh, data assets, new, new new virtual views, for example, of the data, new analytical assets like dashboards or predictive models or, or reports, 
But once they've built them, then why can't they then add those back into the marketplace so that others can then find those and reuse those? Well, of course, you should be able to do that. And But, of course, you, you need to be able to make sure it's it's governed. You know, there's just not a Wild West situation. We've got some uh, managed process in which we publish those assets and get them approved, get them properly uh, categorized and whatnot uh, uh, before they go appear back in the marketplace. Uh, for for more people to start start using those as well, and so incrementally we build up more and more high value uh, data and analytical assets here. And of course, as I said, you can monitor all of this, understand who's using what, the frequency of use within of, of this kind of stuff within the uh, enterprise. We may be able to then see people constantly using the same data. Maybe we could then judge them as a data expert uh, who really understands that data a lot. Um, we can understand how people navigate the um, the overall uh, data marketplace and ultimately um, have itself learned so that ultimately starts recommending, starts uh, suggesting data to us that that's going to help us with the jobs that we're doing in and around different parts of the business. And uh, ultimately, you may choose to expose this to the outside world, maybe to monetize it, to make it available to customers or partners. Um, or suppliers and and uh, and offer the you know data out there uh, uh, you know to, to to monetize it in which case you have to think about a whole bunch of other things like security and terms and pricing and all those kind of things that you you may need to be able uh, to have to add to it but you know ultimately though the whole idea here is to shorten time to value we, we, we've got a ton of new data that's arriving through digital transformation, many, many new data sources, data pouring in to edge databases, cloud databases, and data storage, and on-premises data, data storage. And, and, and so we've got to somehow get control of that uh, and find a way to shorten time to value in order to live up to a CEO level expectations. If we're gonna do that, um, Let's build ready-made data assets, publish them in an internal data marketplace that people can then quickly find uh, the data they're looking for ready-made, jumpstart their project, and let them get on with delivering value that, that, that we need and be as disruptive as we can in the marketplaces within which you operate. Okay, I hope that's given you an idea of what you could potentially do with around data marketplaces. So with that, I'll... Um, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, stop my presentation and uh, I'll hand back to Andy. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, uh, yeah, oh, thank you very much. Lots of... <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so just, just for the benefit of anyone who might have joined us a little bit late, uh, uh, the whole presentation, in fact, is uh, available on demand uh, immediately after after this. So you can go back and catch the beginning should you have missed anything. Uh, you can also go and review and pause and, and, and rewind on any bits that uh, you, you want to, uh, to to look at also. Um, as I mentioned, we, we have got some questions to, to go through later, but we're gonna do them at the end of the show. Um, so I'm gonna invite on our second presenter now. Uh, over Thanks to Andy, you, let me also share my screen, hopefully without the TARDIS effect. Yes, that's good. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do, I, uh, Mike gave this great presentation, great explanation about the benefits of uh, an enterprise data marketplace and also some of the capabilities, some of the features that you'd want to build into that marketplace to get best advantage, best value from your data assets. So I'm really going to talk about uh, a few examples of customers uh, of Denodo who have actually built uh, data marketplaces using data virtualization as part of their base technology. Uh, these are the um, three particular use cases, three examples, uh, three different organizations in very different industries. Um, you know, uh, uh, an investment bank, uh, an education uh, university, an education facility, and an insurance company. Uh, so let's start off with the first one, which is actually one of the largest banks in the world. I think it's like the fourth largest bank in the world. 
Uh, the challenge that they had is very similar to what Mike was talking about. They, they were drowning in complexity. It was, it was a very complex environment. They had data everywhere. It was in files. It was in applications. It was copied to the data warehouse. It was copied to the data lake. They had multiple reporting tools, dashboards, applications using this data. It's that typical hairball sort of environment. And it's very hard for the users to find the data that they need in this environment. Adding new technologies, uh, such as cloud data sources, um, when they were added, that just increased the complexity of the problem. So, you know, it, it, uh, our, our environments are not getting simpler. They're, they're getting more and more complex as we add more and more new technologies. We add new tools, and we even go and add uh, a, a new uh, um, technologies, uh, advanced analytics, machine learning, AI, start building our predictive models like Mike was talking about. So the situation with the bank was getting, it was getting so complex that it was actually difficult to take advantage of the data that they needed. Um, Mike talked about silos, and in many ways, uh, he's quite right if you think about the flow of data in the silos. But the problem is once it gets into the silos, it then gets scattered everywhere. Hence the sort of the hairball that we see on this slide here. So the bank was uh, having challenges. Um, first of all, just supporting the increasing number of tools that were being used to access and provide insights into the data. We saw that on the previous slide. As you add more tools, different tools, people adopt Tableau, they adopt Power BI, you start introducing your analytics tools maybe Machine Learning Studio on Azure or somebody writing Python scripts, um, you're just increasing the complexity and it makes it harder and harder to manage all of these new tools and you start to constrain the ability of users to use the tools that they want. Introducing new technologies was a challenge. Um, the point-to-point -point architecture that we saw before become rigid and almost resistant to change. Uh, data lifecycle management um, it was very difficult. Michael, Mike talked about this in terms of applying governance policies, the difficulty in doing that. And as we all know, systems never seem to retire. They, they just sort of keep on going in zombie life. So we keep adding new systems, but we never manage to actually finally kill off those old ones. They're always around for 20 years beyond their useful life. And it was just, you know, the bank was finding it difficult to manage these types of uh, issues. Finally, it was just really, really hard for the users to find relevant, accurate, trusted data. It was actually slowing them down to the point where they couldn't actually, um, you know, it, it was slowing down the business. It was, it was making them less agile. It was making them more cumbersome, slower to react to changing business environment. And as we know, over the past 12 months or so, you, you have to be very dynamic when you're reacting to the, uh, the, the changes in the environment. So the bank decided to create a data marketplace, very similar to what Mike has been talking about. Um, so the idea is that users can quickly, easily find the data that they need. So the primary objectives of the marketplace were uh, make it easy for users to access the data they need. Even before that, make it easier for them to actually find the data they need before they need to access it. You have to do this in a secure manner. You have to protect access to data. You have to protect PII data. You can't just have a marketplace and then have it open to everybody. So there has to be security built in, well understood access controls, ensuring data privacy, data masking, and, and, and all the good things like that. They wanted to reduce the barriers to adoption for new data, new data sources, new technologies, et cetera. Um, they wanted to have a consistent interface, a single place, a well understood uh, way of going finding the data. If I go to the data marketplace, I can find the data, I can access the data, I can use the data. And it's trusted data. That's one of the key things that Mike talked about trusted data, not just letting people loose onto the data sources and then everybody having. Um, different understandings, different meanings of the data. It has to be trusted data. And finally, agility, uh, allowing them to react quickly to changing circumstances, allowing people to get to the data and get timely insights into that data.
So the bank uh, used data virtualization to build um, their data marketplace. Uh, they built some initial data sets with fine business semantics on top of their systems of records, on top of their data lake and their data warehouse. Now, this is what Mike talked about. You know, we, we, we are now are starting to apply definitions to the actual data. Um, so on top of this semantic layer, you know, consistent understanding, consistent meaning of the data, uh, the bank went and built uh, the data marketplace themselves. This is what they call the data marketplace, this top layer. And this is what I call curated, um, pre-integrated, pre-calculated views of data. So it's approved, trusted, governed, and secure. Mike mentioned the need to have ready-made trusted data sets, not build everything from scratch. And this was that data marketplace. So if I want data about clients, I can go to the data marketplace. If I want information about uh, positions or uh, market data, I can go to the data marketplace and I can get that. I'm no longer having to hunt for the data, create my own data sets, start from scratch. It's delivered to me on the plate. Also, the uh, data virtualization platform has a data catalog built into it. So using the data marketplace, the users are able to search for the data, find the data, explore the data, understand its schema, understand its meanings, its definitions, the descriptions of it, uh, access the data. And it can also, the data can be categorized, it can be tagged. Uh, you can look at usage statistics. There's even a recommendation engine built into it which will actually recommend data sets based on your role and what your colleagues are doing. So in, 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 you know, if I'm going to go and pick data set A and everybody else in my role is using data set B, it will, the recommendation engine can actually tell me, oh, look, all your colleagues are using data set B. Maybe you're using the wrong tool. Maybe you're using the wrong data set, should I say. So that's the Global Investment Bank. Now, if we look at the second use case, this is actually um, Indiana University, slightly different from the other two examples. Uh, this data marketplace is actually targeted at uh, a very specific subset of users. In this case, it was the senior decision makers within the university. This We're talking about the vice chancellor, the provost, the deans, the heads of schools, heads of departments, et cetera. The people who made decisions about the future direction, the budgets within the university itself. Um, Indiana University is a large state university, obviously in the state of Indiana. Uh, it has, uh, I think it's eight or so campuses um, across the state, running from the beautifully named South Bend in the north of the state to southeast in the southeast of the state. Uh, you can see the figures there, uh, you know, 111, 115,000 students, 20,000 staff. Um, half of them administrative, half of them faculty. Uh, the operating budget of the university is about $3.7 billion uh, a year. So it's a big enterprise, really. It's, it's the equivalent of a large organization. Their challenge is that they had data scattered across the different schools, the different departments, the different campuses. And there was a, a sense of ownership of this data. The, the law school owned the data about the law school students, not the University of uh, Indiana. It was the law school that owned it. So there were silos built up around the different schools and departments within the university. And there was a lack of accurate data across the organization as a whole. Um, they didn't even have an accurate count of the number of people they employed, the, the full-time equivalents, the FTEs. And it was the uh, vice chancellor who said, how can we run the university? How can we manage our budget if we don't know how many people we pay every month? That's the sort of challenges they had. So the university decided that they were going to uh, have this initiative called the Decision Support Initiative. And the goal of this was to make uh, timely, relevant, and accurate information available to the decision makers and use data to drive their decisions. Give them the data, allow them to make data-driven decisions, hopefully better decisions, hopefully better outcomes at the end of it. And again, this was for the decision makers. So this data marketplace that they built was actually for a very, very specific subset of the user community. It wasn't a general purpose one. 
uh, such as Mike has been talking about, such as we saw with the Global Bank. Again, they, they, they built the data marketplace. They had a data catalog to go with it. They actually used visualization tools like Tableau to present easily digestible reports and dashboards for the users, or people could get the data in Excel as well if they wanted to drill down a bit more. So uh, a, a classic sort of data marketplace where you could go in and actually look at the data. And actually, this is a public website. You can't see the data, but you can actually go there and actually go to the website uh, at IndiaU. It's dsi.iu.edu. And you can go in there, and they talk about uh, the initiative. They talk about the different dashboards that are available within their marketplace, et cetera. And, you know, you can even go and look at these. You can go and just run the reports in Tableau. You can get the data itself. There's also a, a self-service element to this where people can go and, and find and access data so they can build their own views. But again, they're building it, as Mike said, on top of that trusted data. You're not going and just helping yourself the data from the student record system, from the finance system. You're building it on top of curated, approved, trusted data sets. So you've got a solid foundation for your self-service uh, initiative. And this was the, the fact that you could even have this type of data available in the university was a re revelation to a lot of the senior managers because they were used to dealing with um, uh, partial information, sporadic information, um, inaccurate information. And, and this changed their whole perspective of what data was available and how to get the best out of those data assets. Last uh, example I'm going to talk about is an insurance company. It's Guardian Life Insurance Company in New based in New York City. Um, this is a general purpose marketplace that Mike has been talking about. And it's a great example of a lot of the things that Mike talked about when he was talking about the capabilities that you should be thinking about that you need in your enterprise data marketplace. Garden Life wanted a single place where people could come and find, single place where users, business users, could come and find the data that they actually needed to do their jobs, to make use of the data, take advantage of it. Uh, they wanted to follow uh, a well-understood paradigm for building this marketplace. Uh, in that little screenshot there, you can see the little shopping cart. They followed the e-commerce idea of you can go and connect to the data marketplace. You can browse it. You can search it. We have categories of uh, data assets, they call it. So the, the, the data assets were categorized. They were tagged. Uh, there was a crowdsourcing, crowd rating capability so that the users could actually rate the value of the actual data uh, assets, the data sets themselves. Um, it was available uh, so that you could go and browse around, search around, uh, look at the top rated, et cetera. But once you found something of interest, you could actually go and look at the information about it, drill down into the details. Now, notice nothing so far has been technical. This is intended for business users. This is to help business users find the data they need and then access the data. Notice we've got things like the data owners. This was something that Mike talked about, um, uh, as well as information about who the publisher is, what the format is, how will this be delivered, a CSV file, for example. It's a one-time snapshot because it's census data in this case. If I clicked on data dictionary, it would tell me all about the structure and the format of that data set. Um, but this has given me enough information to work out whether this is information that is valuable and useful to me. And if I want it, I can add it to my cart. This is very much like Mike talked about, this idea that I can go and buy this data, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I can request it by adding it to my cart. And if I add it to my cart, it will be provide the data will be provided to me if I have permission to access that data. And if I do have permission, then it's added into my inbox. It's my data. It's the data that I can access, and I can go and access it whenever I want. I can access it by just clicking on Run Service, and depending on the delivery format, it could be sent to me as a file. It could be give me a, 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 a REST API, a REST uh, string, 
so that I can go and access it through a REST API, give me a JDBC or ODBC string so I can put it, plug it into my Tableau tool to access the data through Tableau or something like that. So depending on the delivery format depends on what run service actually means. Now, behind the scenes, uh, Guardian Life actually had um, the data marketplace. They had administrators, so they had data stewards and everything that Mike was talking about. The users came into the data marketplace, which was a browser-based uh, web app, so they could go and browse the data, et cetera. They go to checkout. I've put something into my shopping cart. I want to check out. And now it goes through that authorization or fulfillment process. Uh, do I have authorization to actually access the data? Now, what's interesting, this is what Mike talked about, what's interesting here is if I don't have authorization to access the data, the data marketplace actually kicks off a service now task, which will automatically go notify the data owner and say, hey, Paul wants to access your data. Are you going to approve it? And that user can approve or deny my access. If they approve it, ServiceNow will automatically go and tell the marketplace to update its um, authorization uh, capabilities to give me access to that data. And then I can go and fulfill it. The fulfillment can be um, is done through the data virtualization platform. Fulfillment could be through you know, uh, delivering you a file, delivering data to your dashboard delivering your URL so you can access data through a REST API if you want to develop it for an application or a machine learning model in Python or something like that. The users never directly access the data sources. The data is delivered to them through the data virtualization platform. The last thing I want to point out, something that very interesting that Mike talked about was we're going to see more things than just data sets, virtual or physical, in the data marketplace. And if you look at that trusted information store, you'll see business objects in there. Guardian Life actually added business object reports and dashboards into their data marketplace. Users could select them. And running that service that we saw on the previous screenshot would actually launch business objects with that data preloaded into the report or dashboard. So they were already incorporating. This was going back nearly five years now uh, when they uh, gave us these snapshots and diagrams. Um, they, they started to introduce non-data assets into their data marketplace. So that's a trend that will continue. And, and like Mike said, we'll start to see um, reports, dashboards, uh, analytical models being in the marketplace because there are assets that people want to access. Um, this is my last slide. This is my blatant marketing slide. Uh, if you do want to find out more about data virtualization, about the marketplace, how to, sorry, about the data catalog, and you can use it to build the marketplace, you can take out a free trial on the cloud, on Google, AWS, or on Azure, and there's the URL. And with that, I will hand everything back to Andy. So if I stop sharing my screen, and there he is. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, yes, on the links there that was at the uh, end of the uh, presentation um, visitors you'll also see there's an attachments um, bar underneath the screens and there's some uh, really helpful stuff from Donodo in there so including that link so if you if you want to find them go in, in there um, we do have some questions we've got some time so um, I'm going to uh, put some of the ones that we've uh, that we've that we've got to the uh, to the panelists um, in in terms of um, success factors this person's asked um uh, getting a data warehouse up and running um if you'd like to take a, a success factors or indeed you know barriers that people face um we'll start with success factors first though um what are the critical success factors in getting a data marketplace up and running so i'll i'll, I'll come to you mike um and then we'll come to you paul after <clears throat> okay i mean for me um that's a good question. I mean, I think for me, the the the, the one of the key critical success factors here is organization. Actually, um, it's it, it it's organizing uh, to be able to produce uh, these assets and and get them published and sort of kind of create a kind of supply chain or production line kind of capability in order to do that. I I, I think 
Um, if everybody's just out there doing their own thing in their own business unit, it, 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 it's, it's kind of not coordinated. And you, you do need, I think, some kind of overseeing sort of federated, if you like, organizational structure that kind of almost acts as acts like a, a glue to kind of link what's going on across different parts of the business in a, in a, in a kind of program, you know, like a, like a nerve center kind of program office where, where all of, you can understand what's being produced and then be then, it, you know, get into a position to start organizing it and getting it published. I think, I think the whole organizational thing is actually a really, really critical success factor here. Um, because you, you know, without without willingness to be able to build up this, uh, the, the, then then it's difficult. I think the other thing is alignment with strategic business objectives here, in order to be able to make sure that that the assets are not only just classified as not just data assets or whatever, but they're 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 linked or tagged to to particular business objectives, so that you can quickly see, you know. Um, business objectives that that these assets are trying to address you know like how do you reduce fraud or if there's a target to be able to uh, reduce operational cost in a particular area of your business by a certain percentage point you know what's helping you contribute to that what have you built that's contributing to that because i think if, if you're able to do that by business objective it, it, it allows people to see progress it allows you know, see how you're filling things out in order to achieve these business goals. Um, so I think I think that th those would be, uh, I guess, some of the the key things that that, that I would say would, would would be pretty important. And I think the roles and responsibilities around what I what, what I covered in my presentation would would also help with that. Perfect. Uh, thank you. And and Paul, uh, feel free to go for barriers or sort of success factors for this because I think both are relevant. And yeah. You know, well, I, I, I could argue the barrier is the opposite of the success factor. <laughs> um, I, I agree with Mike, it's organization. I, I think in many, uh, we, we have lots of technology. We have lots of great technology. We usually fail to implement it properly because of organizational problems, not because of technology problems. Uh, the technology is there. It works. Uh, I gave a couple of examples, but the organization is absolutely right. And it's not just the organization of the initial data marketplace, that's good, but how do you maintain it and feed it? How do you take new data assets and have some sort of governance pipeline to approve them and add them to the data marketplace so it becomes self-perpetuating? The users start mm -hmm. to create their own value and add it back into the marketplace. But without that governance, it becomes a dumping ground and then it becomes useless. Yeah. Um, so you, you've got to have people think, if I go to the marketplace, I can get good data, I can get trusted data, I can get valuable data. So you need the governance, you need the control, but if it's all coming from one central team, it eventually winds down and becomes very static. So you need the community building back into the marketplace, but with those controls. Yes, okay. Um, we've got a couple of things uh, propped up about uh, self-service tools and um, uh, it's an interesting take here the, the um, in terms of um, do, do you need a data marketplace if every department or every everybody within the industry or in the within the business sorry has their own self-service tools and can essentially access what they want I suppose um, I, I, I certainly think you dead right you need it because I mean the assumption is you've got multiple tools, everybody can see what everybody's doing, which is exactly not the case, right? I mean, so, so if I got this tool and somebody else got that tool, um, but they've got no idea what I'm building, and I've got no idea what they've built because there's no standard way in which to share anything across these different tools. And so unless there's APIs and you know vendors have got together to use those APIs in order to be able to understand what exists in each of those different tools the, you, you just remain in your in your own little silo and you don't really know what what's going on or what's being built around you if if other tools are being being used around the organization and so in that sense um you, you, you know you, you you just don't get the 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 reuse what you get is reinvention because you can't see beyond what you what, what tooling you've got in front of you and i, and I think that's that's the real problem here, you know, and on, on a, 
unless we start to see more and more integration between catalogs and tools uh, to publish what's being created, you know, I, I, I think you, you, you remain within those silos. And I think that also means there's an obligation on people buying software to make sure that the technologies that they're investing in actually do work together and do integrate in order to make these kind of things really become possible and get the, you know, the, the, the uh, reuse and productivity benefits that come from that, you know, you know, you know, and meet the expectations that we're trying to meet. I mean, otherwise you're, you know, in a way you're running blind because you don't know what, what anyone else has got. Mm. Yes. I mean, um, just to uh, extend on that point, um, if everybody's got their own tools, it, it, it's not necessarily so much as I, I don't know what Mike's doing with his tool when I'm using my tool. It's also that we're both giving our own interpretation of what, say, a customer is. Mike thinks a customer is one thing, I think it's a different thing. I have a different criteria. Maybe I have a different uh, way of classifying certain customers. So when we start talking to each other, we're talking from different bases. We're talking, you know, it's the Tower of Babel sort of thing. We're talking different languages almost because Mike thinks a customer lives in Manchester. I think a customer lives in New York, and therefore we're going to have different understandings. So yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, you're dead right. It's inconsistency. Uh, it's reinvention. It's really yeah, yeah. Exactly. So if you have the data marketplace and you are giving, this is a definition of a customer. And if you want trusted, curated, quality customer data, you come to the marketplace and you get it. And that way we get in the same definition. Yep. Um, that's one of the key things. And, and I, I can sit here as a you know, member of you know, Denota Technology and say that we can have teams who go to Salesforce and still get the different numbers. <laughs> and they go into the same uh, application because they interpret it differently. With the marketplace, that takes it away from us. And it says, this is the definition of a customer. This is the definition of, you know, this is how we categorize and segment those customers. Perfect, perfect. Well, um, thank, thank you very much, both of you, for a, for a great presentation today, a couple of great presentations and a, and a good Q&A. Thank you for everybody for getting so involved for all the questions and stuff. Seems like there's a lot of interest uh, in this area, which is great. So um, uh, we didn't get to everything. Uh, we'll try and cover it off and, and send some, uh, some answers to you uh, personally if we, if we didn't get back to you. Um, but um, it leaves it to me to say goodbye. So thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, hope hope see you soon. Um, and uh, for for everyone else, I think this is our last one before the uh, turn of the year, uh, or it's the last one that I will be presenting. So have a very merry Christmas in the meantime, and uh, we'll see you in January. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, bye -bye. thanks. Bye, thanks.